Thank you, Zainab, for the kind introduction, and thank you to the organizers for uh, putting together this wonderful event and for inviting me to be part of it. Can you all hear me? OK. Louder still. OK, all right. The Quran is untranslatable. Oh, is that too loud? No, no, that's meant to be. It's blank, blank slide. It's, it's a new thing. <laughs> It's a new thing we do in art history now. We have blank slides, and we don't want to distract you. So I'm, I'm getting in on the act. All right, so let me start again. And you know that it's deliberate now. The Quran is untranslatable. It's a statement many of us have uh, encountered often, even though we all know that the Quran has, in fact, been translated multiple times. Of course, much like that other canard, Islam forbids figural images, the assertion that the Muslim holy book cannot be expressed in a language other than Arabic really describes a supposed guiding principle rather than an observable state of affairs. That is, versions of the Quran may indeed exist in many languages, but Muslims have, we are led to believe, always agreed on the, inimit in sorry, always agreed on the inimitability of the Arabic original, and attempts at translating it constitute a largely modern project spearheaded by and for those outside the faith. This view naturally rests on the Muslim belief that the Quran is the actual word of God as conveyed to the Prophet Muhammad, so that no adaptation can ever preserve its divinely authored character. The issue of whether the Quran could or should be translated was hotly debated in the early 20th century on the heels of the publication of several new English editions. In an article first published in Arabic and then reprinted in English in 1926, Ahmed Muhammad Shakir, a prominent cleric of the Al-Hazar Mosque in Cairo, flatly condemned the practice, stating that, quote, it is an unavoidable truth that it is not lawful to proceed to make a translation of the Holy Quran, unquote. Like many others taking part in the debate, Shakir was convinced that the issue was new, complaining that, quote, we, ha we have had suddenly thrust upon us a question that previous writers and thinkers have not had to concern themselves with, unquote. The notion that translations of the Quran are a recent phenomenon aimed at satisfying modern and questionable demands persists into our own day, yet the historical record tells us something quite different. For not only is the tradition of translating the Quran an old and prolific one, but its main participants and beneficiaries were Muslims themselves. Non-Arabic renditions were produced in large numbers across the Islamic world from the medieval period onwards, invariably in the form of texts placed between the lines of Arabic. And um, I should note, in, in light of Alia's talk, that what I'm defining as Qurans here are uninterrupted copies of the Arabic text. So a Quran might contain other materials, and as we're going to see, they very often do. But um, its own content, the scripture itself, has to be written as a cohesive whole to qualify as a Quran, by my definition. Qurans containing such interlinear translations survive in their hundreds, perhaps their thousands, and are particularly associated with Persian and Turkish-speaking regions. The works in question are by no means unknown. A good number have been published, and several examples are included in the very exhibition that this symposium accompanies. Nevertheless, much of the attention given to these manuscripts has been philological, and they have received comparatively little art historical interest. My talk today will consider this category of Quran principally from a visual perspective, demonstrating some of the practices and features that, with remarkable consistency, characterize these manuscripts across various regions and over many centuries. Although I'm not qualified to talk at any length about matters philological, I will also touch on the linguistic aspects of the topic, particularly since they overlap in many ways with questions of artistry, both in content and in form, the interlinear translations are, as we shall see, always deferential to the Arabic that surrounds them. The title of my talk is deliberately punning, for beyond the issue of how Quranic Arabic was rendered into other languages, I also wish to consider what these manuscripts can tell us about the visual rendering of the word of God itself. The art of Quran production had achieved such refinement by the medieval period that copies could quite comfortably accommodate foreign interpolations without sacrificing their own aesthetic integrity. Despite constituting only a fraction of surviving manuscripts, copies belonging to the interlinear tradition thus exemplify the robust and sophisticated strategies that more generally underpinned the Quran maker's art, 
as I hope to show. Another intentionally blank slide. Um, before we come to the Qurans themselves, let me briefly expand on the theological background. It was a great Iranian cleric, Abu Hanifa, who in the 8th century declared that it was lawful for non-Arabophone Muslims to recite the Quran in their own vernaculars, even if they knew the original Arabic. This Hanafi ruling seems to have codified a practice that was already occurring among some non-Arab converts to Islam, as discussed at length by Travis Zadeh in his excellent book, The Vernacular Quran, though it should be noted that Arabic remained the normative liturgical language regardless of the cultural milieu. And even those communities that began by praying in their native tongues switched before long to the untranslated scripture. The reluctance to maintain an oral liturgical tradition in the vernacular may have been affected by the opinions of the other three schools of Sunni jurisprudence, which all declared that the Quran, being the literal and perfect word of God, was absolutely untranslatable. In the case of written translations, however, Abu Hanifa's position proved rather more influential. His followers, again disagreeing with other Sunnis, decreed that such renderings were acceptable as long as they accompanied the original Arabic text and provided some sort of equal translation, terjima musawiya, which is to say a literal word-for-word -word rendition. As well as privileging the Arabic, this equal approach resulted in texts that were inherently unsuited to recitation, a point on which I should expand presently. And it is perhaps because of this safeguard that the judgment eventually won widespread acceptance in those regions where the Hanafi school held sway, the populations of which, not coincidentally, consisted largely of speakers of Persian and Turkish. Things appear to have got off to a slow and cautious start, as the first definitive case known to us of this sort of translation is not a Quran at all, but rather the late 10th century Persian version of At-Tabari's famous tafsir, or exegesis, of the Quran. At-Tabari's original work had been composed in Arabic, the Quranic text sandwiched between its commentaries. Uh, when, under Samanid patronage, the tafsir was rendered into Persian, the decision was made to keep the Quranic portions in Arabic while adding interlinear translations to them. This important text, of which we have only later and abbreviated derivatives, I'm showing you on here, gave form and legitimacy to the Hanafi viewpoint, paving the way for actual Qurans that followed its model. These began to be produced in large numbers across greater Iran and Central Asia, and though the earliest extant copies cannot be dated securely before the 13th century, they clearly draw linguistically and typologically on the translation, translation devised for the uh, much earlier Samanid project. Qurans with Persian translations were soon joined by those with Turkish ones, which survive in fewer numbers and which come in a variety of Turkic languages and dialects. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to draw a broad distinction in this talk between Eastern Turkish, which is what we find in the earliest copies, and Western Turkish, basically Ottoman Turkish, which came to predominate later. In order to better understand how these translations work, let's look at some renderings of the Quran's opening surah, the Fatiha. Um, it's a messy slide, and not all of you will get much out of it, but just to explain, so on this side we have um, uh, transliterations in white of Arabic, in, I've done very clever color coding here, in purple of Persian and in teal of Turkish. Um, and the, the purple Persian is uh, the one derived from the, the version that was um, devised for the Samanid translation of at tabaris Tafsir. And the Turkish here is a Western Turkish text known as Recension A, which I'll return to later. So, um, and here we have in white English translations and then um, so these were transcriptions, I just, yeah, these are the transcriptions, these are the transliterations of the transcriptions. So there we go. Uh, it should be noted that within each linguistic tradition, numerous translation texts were used, some differing only in minor, minor details, others representing new versions. But the basic idea, as you can see here, I hope, is always the same. Each translated word or phrase is written directly below its Arabic counterpart and follows the order, more or less, of the Arabic. This method is not syntactically felicitous for either Persian or Turkish, whose grammar is unrelated to that of Arabic, 
and the resultant translations are by their nature incapable of competing with the original scripture in terms of eloquence or mellifluence. The King James Bible they ain't. Um, unsuited to recitation or literary enjoyment in their own right, these texts were designed above all to aid comprehension and learning of the Arabic scripture. And it is for this reason that scholars often describe them as glosses. Nevertheless, and as those of you who can read these exa examples will, will hopefully agree, to dismiss the interlinear renderings as meaningless strings of words would be a gross exaggeration. The Persian and Turkish versions may not be all that idiomatic, but they do make sense, and they stop short of adhering to the Arabic syntactical order, where the result would be nonsensical. So in the case of the Turkish, for example, you've got kıyamet uh, günü isi, which defies the Arabic word order and uses the Turkish word order, because otherwise it wouldn't make sense. And in the Persian, meanwhile, we have all this stuff added about Jews and Christians, which is not in the Arabic text at all. So the, the, even though they're meant to be sort of equal and word for word, they're, they, they kind of tweak that idea. A reader without any desire to learn the original scripture could then treat the interlinear texts as self-sufficient, though the principal and certainly notional audience appears to have been one striving to better access the Arabic. Many kinds of readers would, would have benefited from these Qurans with inbuilt lexicons, and it is clear from the provenance and qualitative range of surviving examples that such manuscripts could be found in diverse settings, from the private collections of elite patrons to the more accessible libraries of mosques, medrasas, and mausolea. By way of example, a 30-volume Injuid Quran that I'll return to later contains a wakfiya telling us that it uh, was commissioned by the princess Fars Malik Hatun for, a pri for private use in her residence, and that it was to be transferred upon her death to her tomb, where it would have become available to a wider audience of clerics, students, and visitors. To turn now to the visual character of the interlinear translations, their artistry presents remarkable parallels to their linguistic intent, as typified by this example attributed to Ilkhan Iran. Sorry, Ilkhan Tabriz. The translated text's secondary status is instantly signaled by its appearance, for not only is the Persian smaller than the Arabic, but it is written in a less distinguished calligraphic script, a nondescript chancery hand as opposed to the more commanding muhakkak of the Arabic. But it is the relative disjointedness of the translation that sets it most clearly apart. Because the Persian words are smaller than their Arabic equivalents, they are necessarily more widely spaced, so that the translation is continually interrupted by gaps between its components. Each Persian word or phrasal cluster is, moreover, written at a downward sloping angle, an effect that both exaggerates the translation's piecemeal appearance and insistently points the reader's eye to the Ar Arabic calligraphy, whose visual cohesiveness and rectitude, rectitude stand in marked contrast. Other Qurans differentiate the text still more patently by having the translations in red, as we see in this 13th or 14th century copy. But even those examples with less obvious disparity are highly successful in visualizing the relative standing of their verbal contents. Here I show you an Ilkhanid Quran that is on view in our exhibition. Scripture and translation alike are neatly inscribed in black, the Arabic not all that much larger than the Persian. Yet the separation and angle of the glosses are enough to subordinate them, and our eyes do not struggle to recognize the preeminence of the fluidly written lines of Arabic. That the translation can feature so prominently without disturbing the overall balance of parts is a result of, and testament to, the compositional vigor of the page as a whole. Like their untranslated counterparts, all of the Qurans I've shown utilize a stock of established devices to organize and hierarchize the components of their folios. These devices include ornamental surah headings, extended ligatures for the opening besmeles, rosettes punctuating individual verses, and marginal illuminated medallions that mark every fifth or tenth verse. Besides adding to the book's beauty, such flourishes help the reader-viewer to navigate and better pass the Quranic contents. The result is a well-orchestrated, attractive arrangement that is at once more varied and coherent than the rather undifferentiated, though no less splendid, Qurans of the first century's Hijri. This highly articulated schema, common to virtually all Qurans of the periods I'm discussing, is what allows the interlinear translations to be incorporated without any notable detriment to the whole. The existing framework is robust enough that the glosses simply conform to it rather than the other way around. 
Indeed, apart from their inclusion of vernacular inscriptions, Qurans of the interlinear type are quite standard in design and format, and even the necessarily generous spacing between the lines of Arabic finds its parallel in many untranslated copies of the holy text. So uh, the um, slide is divided into two along the vertical axis. Uh, on the right side, you have two Qurans with the interlinear translations. On the left, you have their twins that don't have interlinear translations, but you know, pretty much have exactly the same format. Uh, the interlinear translations thus present themselves as if an afterthought, neither acknowledged by nor deleterious to the elements that surround them. The effect is not entirely a conceit, for the foreign renderings would have been inscribed after the calligraphing of the Arabic, and there are examples where the glosses were left incomplete or were latterly added to a manuscript that may never have been intended to contain them. Such appears to be the case with an Abbasid Quran, again in our exhibition, whose Persian interpolations occur only sporadically. In most instances, however, Qurans with interlinear texts were planned as such from the outset, even if the glosses are seemingly ignored by the remaining components of the book. Evidence of this is provided by another manuscript from our exhibition, a Quran that features a Persian translation but has been attributed to mid-15th century Edirne. Um, regardless of its place of manufacture, the book was given in endowment by the Ottoman Sultan Mahmud I to the library he founded in 1739 at the Hagia Sophia. Most of the folios in this Quran follow the model we've already seen in terms of the translation's afterthought-like quality. But the opening pages present us with something different. In keeping with wider decorative practices in the arts of the book, these opening pages are more profusely illuminated than the folios that follow, with a network of palmet scrolls filling in the spaces between the Arabic. Nestled among the arabesques are minuscule Persian glosses, the neat outlines around them proving that they belong to the manuscript's original conception. A similar combination of glosses and illuminations occurs in the 30-volume Injured Quran I mentioned earlier, which was produced in Shiraz between 1336 and 1357 for the princess Fars Malik Hatun, daughter of the Injured dynasty's founder. This treatment of the illuminated ground is as close as our Qurans get to conceding the, pres the presence of the interlinear texts, though far from highlighting the Persian words, the surrounding decoration almost subsumes them, minimizing their intrusiveness and ensuring, as usual, that the Arabic scripture emerges visually and conceptually supreme. Such capacity for accommodating extraneous material is, is not unique to Qurans with translations. The practice of furnishing copies of the holy book with additional text was already widespread when the interlinear tradition began, and many of the artistic inventions I've pointed out were, were more widely employed in order to reconcile any secondary matter with the holy text. Three fundamental rules govern the inc in incorporation of ancillary content. First, that this content should somehow be relevant to the understanding, reading, or appreciation of the holy text. Second, that its subordinate status should be made aesthetically obvious. And third, that it should not visually interfere with or detract, detract from the aesthetic coherence of, of the scripture itself. Numerous approaches were followed in the application of these guidelines. Take, for example, this late 12th century Iraqi or Iranian manuscript, which is copiously interspersed with marks and letters to indicate var variant readings of the Quran, and is also provided with marginal notes in Arabic that further elucidate issues of recitation. Because they are in red, or written at a smaller scale than the Quranic text, or relegated to the margins, these elements are self-evidently supplementary, leaving us in no doubt as to what constitutes the scripture itself. A rather more refined Mamluk Quran from the early 14th century demonstrates the same point. Here, the book's margins host three concurrent Arabic commentaries that are written at smaller scale in colored inks and organized, as Marcus Fraser has discussed, according to an underlying geometric scheme that fans out from, and therefore privileges, the main fields of the folios. These fields are dominated by the stately black muhakkak of the Quranic text, whose majuscule regularity is emphasized by the varied and malleable handling of the surrounding material. 
As we have seen, similar conventions of scale, color, and arrangement are at play in the, in the interlinear Qurans, and it is therefore not surprising that many copies with translations also con contain additional marginal content, sometimes planned from the start and sometimes inscribed later. We thus find instances of such marginalia in two of the manuscripts I've already shown. These are, for the most part, Arabic notes on recitation. So you see them here and here, and scattered around the margins. And that's a close-up. A truly magnificent example of a Quran that combines translations with other secondary materials is this fragment, whose margins are richly inscribed with hadith, uh, traditions of the prophet, executed in red kuthik. Despite the striking beauty of these hadith, their scrollwork background, relative illegibility, and wraparound composition designate them as auxiliary borders to, rather than real distractions from, the holy word. Moreover, the Quranic text is in this case of such monumental proportions that it can comfortably stave off such competition, which also explains why the Persian glosses can take bolder form than usual, zigzagging dynamically across the page. This careful balancing act shows the extent to which available artistic strategies were modulated to meet the specific conditions posed by each manuscript. The grander the Arabic, the more imposing its ancillaries could be. Such contextual distinctions operated not only between different manuscripts, but also within single books. Because they are already consigned to the borders of the page, marginalia are typically permitted greater visual congruity than the interlinear translations, which encroach directly onto the privileged space of the Quranic text, and thus require a more rigorous approach to their subordination. We can see these varied strategies at work in this 15th century Iranian Quran that, like many other copies, contains both an interlinear translation and exegetical marginal commentary, which here occupies not one but two zones in the borders. Though not written at an angle, the Persian glosses are divided in the usual manner into discontinuous, widely spaced units, units that pose no calligraphic threat to the flowing muhakkak of the Arabic. No such caution is necessary in the margins, however. These are filled with cohesive blocks of Persian exegesis that, being safely marked off from the scripture, can even afford to share its correct horizontal orientation. Notwithstanding the busyness of the page, the Quranic text easily resists being overwhelmed by the wealth of additional matter around it, and the agreeable juxtaposition of so much material illustrates a success with which artists of the book had both diversified and systematized their procedures for designing Quran manuscripts. As well as benefiting from existing visual practices, the interlinear translations would themselves exert a generative influence on other branches of the arts of the book. Rashid Ad-Din's Tansuk Nameh, a Persian compendium of Chinese medicinal knowledge composed in early 14th century Tabriz, includes terminological glossaries whose format appears indebted to the interlinear Qurans. Written horizontally in red, each transliterated Chinese term is provided with a Persian gloss inscribed at an angle in a smaller black script. Inviting a more speculative, speculative comparison is this 16th century Safavid copy of Jami's Arba'in, in which 40 Arabic hadith, all written in large fluid bands across the page, alternate with their Persian paraphrases, which are executed in a smaller script and, for the most part, oriented at a 45 degree angle to the Arabic. In rare instances, the artistic impact of the interlinear glosses can be felt within the Qurans themselves. Although, as we've seen, most Qurans with translations feign ignorance of their vernacular content, the presence of interlinear texts did on occasion prompt a more creative response on the part of calligraphers, calligraphers and illuminators. A compelling case in point is a famous 30-volume Quran that was made in Iran or Central Asia in the 14th century and is today partially preserved in the John Rylands Library. One of the reasons this Quran is so well known is that its majestic lines of Arabic are accompanied by two interlinear texts, one in Persian, the one on top in Persian, and the other in a dialect of Eastern Turkish. And I should add that this is one of the earliest known cases of a Turkish translation. Such dual translations are found in other Qurans also, but here the intrusion of these vernacular renderings evidently encouraged the calligrapher of the Arabic to up the ante. 
The scripture already generously proportioned is nothing short of ostentatious, especially in its use of gold to highlight key words and phrases. Note in this slide the two occurrences of the word Allah. Here, and I can't see properly. There we go. Um, the two occurrences of the word Allah, which as well as being guilt, are each written as a single curling line. And look also at what this the fee does here. It sort of goes off the page in this extraordinary manner. This manneristic approach is at times carried to extraordinary, length, extraordinary lengths, as we see here in the treatment of the phrase, la ilaha illallah, there is no deity but God. The transformation of these words into an elaborate gold squiggle defies the rules of legibility that copyists of the Quran typically adhered to. Adhered to. Our calligrapher knew, however, that this phrase, part of the Muslim profession of faith, would be familiar to all his readers, and so he's elevated it to the level of a symbol, a pictograph whose recognizability was enough to ensure its correct interpretation. Though the flourishes of the Ryland's Quran are highly idiosyncratic and seemingly determined by their specific content, they reveal something that is fundamental to all Quran manuscripts, the importance not only of the scripture's content, but also of its look, its iconicity, to paraphrase Irvin Schick. Put simply, Quranic Arabic declares itself as such through its very appearance, which took its definitive form in the 11th century when fully vocalized cursive script became the standard. It is the iconic quality of the Arabic that governs the overall makeup of a Quranic page and allows that page to tolerate so much extraneous material. This underlying principle becomes explicit in the Ryland's copy, whose interlinear texts, texts engendered the conditions by which the latent visual symbolism of the Arabic could be made manifest. In the remainder of my talk, I shall briefly address what became of such translations following their medieval peak. As exemplified by the Ryland's Quran, the Persian and Turkish translations began with closely shared histories in overlapping geographies, but they were to diverge considerably in the early modern period. The Persian glosses enjoyed a healthy continuation during the Safavid period, when Iran was converted to Shiism, and in the 17th century, a new standardized scheme emerged, whereby the translation is inscribed in a small red nestalik and the Arabic in a large black nesh, with horizontal lines separating the texts. Qurans featuring such ruled interlinear strips became a common type in Iran and India from the 17th century onwards, with the strips usually left blank, as you see here, and sometimes illuminated. It is not surprising that this format, with its intrinsic compartmentalization, was found to be inherently well suited to copies containing translations. The switch to Nestalik was another savvy move that likewise capitalized on newly available devices. Developed in Iran during the 14th and 15th centuries, this relatively young script was calligraphically quite unlike earlier styles and, be and became especially identified with the writing of secular Persian texts. Its appearance and associations therefore rendered it, rendered it a fitting choice for the glosses, whose non-Arabic character now found visual expression. Thoroughly differentiated from the Arabic, as well as cordoned off from it by the lines, these later glosses are permitted to run in more fluid lines than was the case hitherto, and they also employ updated, more idiomatic translations. The one used in this example was composed for the late 17th century Safavid ruler, Suleyman Shah. This new format remained productive in the Qajar period and also traveled to India, where it gave rise to printed derivatives that circulated well into the 20th century, and if any of you knows of more recent examples, please do let me know. In contrast to the longevity and vitality of the Persianic tradition, glosses of the Turkish variety fared far less well. The burgeoning of the Mamluk and Ottoman polities naturally moved the focus of production of the Turkish copies to the Western Turkophone world, with the earliest known examples from this region dating to the 15th century. This new chapter began promisingly enough, as shown by this beautiful Quran, which uh, Alison introduced us to earlier, as shown by this beautiful Quran, copied at the end of the 15th century in Mamluk Cairo for the treasury of Amir Khansu Hamsiya. Most of the folios present us with the by now familiar layout. 
though the glosses of the richly illuminated opening pages are allowed to zigzag exuberantly and even turn upside down. You can see, I think it's this one here. Yeah, which is at the Turkish show, that is actually upside down. Uh, the translation used in this manuscript is that known in the scholarship as recension A, which I introduced earlier in my, uh, when I showed you the slide with all that uh, sort of busy text on it. Adapted from medieval Eastern Turkish prototypes, this recension A text became canonical in the Western Turkish tradition, especially in the, especially in the Ottoman Empire. Its authoritative status seems to have rested on its linguistic conservatism, which not only lent it to certain venerability, but also fulfilled the task of providing a genuinely Turkish gloss, largely free of recent loan words. And it should be noted that the Persian glosses similarly strive to use words of native etymology. Uh, Recensione quickly became a victim of its own success, however, for its archaizing language, rooted in Eastern idioms, soon lost its relevance to speakers of Western Turkish, whose lexicon had been more profoundly affected by borrowings from Arabic and Persian. One answer to this problem was to gloss the glosses, um, as in this early 15th century Ottoman copy, where the entirely Turkish phrase, Yanut gini is guni isi, Lord of the Day of Judgment, is explained using a more modern Ottoman paraphrase that is half composed of Arabic. The later the Quran, the more such secondary glosses occur. An early, seven, an early 16th century recension, a copy from the Birnbaum collection, for example, contains so many marginal clarifications that the scribes had to use arrow-like devices, I've circled them, um, to, to point the way to the explanations in the, margin, in the margins. And this, of course, suggests the growing inefficacy of the, uh, the glosses. An alternative solution was to revise the translation itself, which is what happens in these two 18th century Qurans, both of which move away from recension A to something more idiomatically Ottoman. Judicious as this move may seem, the result is curiously tautological in that much of the Quranic scripture ends up being glossed using words that are themselves of Arabic origin. Illustrating the point is this sample page from the later of the two Qurans, against which is compared the old recension A version, and I've color coded the reduplication of Arabic lexemes, so you can see how they really start proliferating in the later, later translation. Perhaps because of their lexical redundancy, these updated translations did not take hold, and after the 16th century, production of Ottoman Qurans with Turkish glosses fell into decline before fizzling out altogether in the 1800s. Moreover, hardly any of the Ottoman examples, including the earlier ones, are luxury copies attributable to elite patronage, quite unlike what we find in the Safavid and Qajar cases. The reasons for this disparity await further research, though it seems safe to say that the principal settings for interlinear Qurans in the Ottoman context were educational institutions, the members of which would have had less and less use for etymologically Turkish glosses of the type enshrined by recension A. To be sure, Ottoman students of the Quran would still have required considerable help to grasp the complexities of the scripture, but this they could gain from other sources, such as grammars and tafsirs. These are the probable circumstances under which Ottoman translated Quran ceased to exist as a viable category, and so complete was their demise that early 20th century commentators could be oblivious to the fact that such a tradition had existed at all. Suffice it to recall the angry words of Ahmed Muhammad Shakir. Revisiting Shakir's assertions in the light of the material I've presented does not, however, lead to a straightforward debunking of them. While he is demonstrably wrong in branding Quran translations newfangled and ab aberrant, his more general claim concerning the scripture's inviability is in no way undermined by the manuscripts I've discussed. On the contrary, one can argue that the Persian and Turkish glosses, always contingent on the Arabic and incapable of replicating its eloquence, ultimately uphold the very notion that they would seem to defy, that the Quran is untranslatable. This paradox operates also on an artistic level, for in encroaching upon the space of the Quranic text, the glosses only encourage the reader-viewer to better appreciate the Arabic's visual integrity and elegance. More than any other category of Quran, copies with interlinear translations test and therefore confirm the aesthetic resilience and iconic charge of holy scripture as manifested by artists of the book. One kind of rendering thus serves as a foil to another, highlighting beyond any doubt the supremacy of God's own word. 
Thank you.